hello, everyone. Thank you. You know, it's a little bit of a transition coming from the world of elected politics in Philadelphia, because in the past, to get everyone's attention, you would yell, yo, <laughs> loud and repeatedly until, until uh, everybody turned your way. So thank you, um, welcome, and this is our first Women of Public uh, Leadership event today, so we're grateful for your support. You know, having been in public service for the past 10 years, before joining 70, I had the opportunity to work with, uh, alongside a number of leaders from the commissioner's office to our city and our state, and two of whom we're going to hear from today, State Representative Joanna McClinton and State Representative Martina White. Um, we're also grateful to have with us today Tamla Edwards from 6ABC, who will be moderating the conversation, and uh, of course, our Civic Leadership Award to Judith von Seidnick. Um, and speaking of women leaders, I would be remiss not to acknowledge Committee of 70's own Chief Program Officer, uh, Lauren Christella, who I'm sure all of you know. This was really Lauren's idea, so uh, consequently she had to do all the hard work to put it all together uh, and organize it for us today. Uh, so I wanna thank her, and of course I wanna thank you. Uh, I don't think there's anyone here that needs much if any convincing that our democracy is in a, at a critical juncture right now and when I go to election-related events around the country, what I hear a lot from elected leaders and others is how they really wish in their city or their state they had a nonpartisan, non-political, trusted organization to provide information to voters uh, on elections in this time of so much misunderstanding and so much uh, misinformation. So it doesn't take me long to realize that exactly what they're describing is the Committee of 70, and that we're ahead of just so much of the country, and that we're at the right place and in the right time for this important um, effort that we're in. It's particularly true of one of our programs called We Vote, which is already successful. It was launched in 2020 to work with uh, businesses, to work with uh, civic leaders in the city and media organizations uh, to partner with them to distribute uh, voter information, election information, and encourage civic engagement initiatives. Uh, and, but 70 is not just sort of focused on the present, no matter how important that is, it's also focused on the future. And every year we bring in a new, new cohort of Buckholtz Fellows. Some alumni are here with us today. <laughs> Some of our current Buckholtz Fellows are with us today. And I would, if I could leave you with one thing, really encourage you to think about the people sort of in your world who you regard as future leaders, that you would, who you would um, uh, nominate or support or encourage to apply for this great program. Because uh, it's opening up Applications are opening up sort of next week. So in closing, I hope you'll enjoy today's conversation. Uh, and I just want to thank you all for joining us and for your support of the Committee of 70. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage the Museum of the American Revolution's Chief Operating Officer, Zeanne Mason. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to welcome you and to have you all here today, women, strong women, affecting positive change, recognizing um, this important work in um, our community with women affecting change in public leadership. Listening to you, Al, and looking at your website for the Committee of 70, there's so much synergy in the work that you do and the work that we do here. We too are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, trusted organization. Uh, right now, there's probably 800 to 1,000 kids downstairs exploring our galleries. Um, they've been coming now for uh, 
during the spring break period every day for weeks on end, and we have people from around the world that are also coming. Um, our mission, like yours, is to inspire and engage uh, people to be more active citizens. And we do that by sharing compelling stories about the complex events and diverse people that sparked America's ongoing experiment in liberty, equality, and self-government. And yes, it's a journey that um, is unfinished work. Uh, I hope if you haven't had a chance to come see us, you'll take advantage of the two tickets that we've offered you today. And as a relatively new museum, I'm always curious how many of you have been here. Okay, many, welcome back, um, and come back again soon. Uh, in addition to the work that we do um, in our galleries, we also have programming that uh, ties again with the kind of work that you do. Uh, we have a citizenship initiative that's now in its uh, third year, I think, um, and that is a program that's free for people that are trying to pass their citizenship test, and we use our galleries as laboratory as they learn about our history. Um, just about a month ago when we celebrated our fifth anniversary, uh, in this very room we had a naturalization ceremony. And following that, and I think we had people from 22 different countries, um, they lined up to sign up to vote, uh, which was also really wonderful to see. And uh, just last week, we closed our doors to the public so that we could be a voting location. That was something that we started to do during the pandemic because we had to be totally closed, but it just turned into such a lovely and synergistic thing for us that we're happy to do that for the two districts that um, utilize uh, this, this beautiful facility as a, a voting location. So again, welcome. Um, wonderful to have you, and thank you for all the good work you do as members of the Committee of 70. Please welcome Laura LaRosa, Executive Director and Managing Director of Glenmead. Hi everybody, thank you so much for being here. When Lauren first brought up this idea of doing something just for women in public leadership, I was like, we want to be the presenting sponsor. So together with my colleagues who are here, uh, to support us today. Um, uh, we have a very, very strong impact investing group. And so I went to the head of the impact in investing group and I said, let's do this. And he was like, let's do it. So we're so happy to be able to support women, especially in these days. There's so much that we are challenged with. We need such strong women in public leadership now more than ever. And, um, and we would, you know, as a company, we, we support strong leadership by women. Um, personally, I know all of my colleagues do. Um, thank you so much for being here. I think this is gonna be a wonderful presentation. And Lauren, thank you for putting this together, for coming up with the idea, and for all of the work that you did to make it a success. So thank you. Hello, hello, there we go. Good afternoon, it is good to be here with you for this inaugural event. I was excited when they asked me to do it and so thankful that you ladies were willing to come and be with us here today. And most of you know both of them, but I will give a little bit of an introduction. I'll start with State Representative Joanna McClinton, who is a Democrat. She serves parts of West and Southwest Philadelphia in Yaden and Darby and Delco. She's made history twice as the first woman in African-American elected caucus chair in 2018. And then in 2020, she became the first woman elected House Democratic leader. She's local and a graduate of LaSalle and Villanova Law. And to her right is State Representative Martina White, who is a Republican. She represents Bustleton, Millbrook, Parkwood, and Somerton. She was elected in 2015, becoming the first new Republican elected from Philadelphia in 25 years. She's the first woman to chair the Philadelphia GOP. She also serves as the Secretary of the House Republican Caucus, and she's a graduate of Elizabethtown College. So first of all, I'm going to start with essentially asking you how you got here. Like, what made you say, I want to go into politics, and how and why did you choose your party? I'll start with you, Martina. 
Sure. Uh, so I was actually asked to run for public office by a local committee woman and longtime family friend. We were out at an event and she suggested that I run or at least consider it for a special election where the seat had become open uh, due to, a, I don't know if you're familiar with Congressman Brendan Boyle, but he uh, used to hold my seat and he won his congressional district. So um, in an exciting time and in a time where uh, obviously not many people believed that a Republican could win uh, in the city of Philadelphia, it was very unexpected. I decided to run because a lot of times there's no one for people to pick from on the ballot. You know, Republicans either can't get on because there's not enough registered Republicans in the district or, um, you know, the Republican just, the, there's no candidate running. So I decided it in that way uh, to run, but also because I love helping people. Uh, for a long time, I actually worked as a financial advisor helping families and small businesses with financial planning and um, you know how to save for college, et cetera. But from there, it was uh, you know just an exciting time for me in my life. I was pretty young, I was only like 26. So um, trying to decide what to do was uh, really just about leaving the door open for an opportunity for change and a career path that I you know, uh, obviously enjoy today. So I'm really glad that I, I made that, uh, that jump over to uh, serving in public office. Yeah, Joanna. So I wanna start off by saying I was working in the Senate when Martina was elected and I saw her in the hallway one day outside her office and I popped in there and I regret these words today. But, <laughs> but I, I said something like, I'm so proud of you. Uh, <laughs> it's a joke, <laughs> it's just a joke. And I, I'm still proud of her because she was a young woman, uh, you know, was not expected to win and I was just proud. I was working in the Senate and was so excited and I ended up running later that year and had no plans of running for office in my life. Give you a lot of hope, Joanna. <laughs> You showed me the lights. I needed to get elected myself. Uh, I was working in the Senate for Senator Anthony Hardy Williams as his chief counsel. Before that, I was a public defender for almost 10 years here in Philly. And I was one of the women that took several asks. My senator was the main one asking, and I kept saying, not interested. I work here. I see what it's like. I do not want to put my name on the ballot and be the reason why it's raining. I, I, I just rather not deal with that. So after several asks and a really brief period, similarly, the next special election that was to occur in 2015 was going to be in August. It's like, okay, get real. You don't have to do it. Everybody else wants to do it. But I'd like to support you because I know you. You've worked in the office. You've developed a good reputation amongst our constituents. And so I had one weekend to look myself in the mirror and ask, why am I afraid to run for office? What is it? Is it because I'm not worthy? Is it because I think I might lose? And I'm so grateful that I got out of my head, uh, listened to my senator and those around me who said I could do it and ran because it is an opportunity that I truly enjoy. I love my community and I love serving my neighbors and look up and now I'm in leadership like Martina um, as the first woman to lead our caucus. It's, it's a whole lot of work and major responsibilities in the times we're facing, but it's a true privilege and honor. And ladies, I have to say, it's easy for people to throw stones and complain, so we are grateful for those who are willing to be the woman in the arena. So thank you both for that. And, you know, it is a truism that politics in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania is a boys' club. And I'm sure you have a great story that you think of. I want to hear it and how you got around it. I'll start with you, Martina. Yeah, um, this is a really tough one. I uh, <laughs> This is all off the record. We won't tell them what you said. Are you said. sure? Is that camera off in the back? Um, it's, no, listen, it's gonna I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So, look, you know, the the legislature is uh, very enjoyable, but, but also a very challenging place uh, to, to work. You know, you have to build relationships, and it uh, involves working across party lines, but also... Uh, you know, with, with other members that come from different backgrounds and different times in, in their experience in their life. So um, when I first got in in 2015, my mentor was John Taylor, who was at that time the only elected Republican in the city for like 30 years or so. And um, he was amazing, but when you are trying to build those relationships with other members that he knows, and he's been, you know, around for, again, 30 years, 
you know, I, I'm not going out to smoke cigars. Like, that's not my thing. Um, but, you know, you try to find ways to relate and you try to find ways to work together. Um, and the way I just kind of worked around it was just trying to, you know, go to the dinners and go to the lunches and try to get to know the members in a different outlet instead of, um, you know, just having to go to the cigar smoke lounge thing. So, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's one of the examples. I'm sure there's many others, but I am very proud to have had John Taylor as a mentor, even though he was an older uh, gentleman. He certainly taught me a lot, and he... When I first got up there, he taught me, he's like, Martina, just remember, he took me to the top of the house floor and we're standing there and he's like, just remember that each of these people is the best that their district had to offer. <laughs> I was like, okay, duly noted, John. Thank you for that uh, clarification. So, um, you know, it, like I said, it's about building those relationships and, and finding the way to, to make it work. My guess is there are a few people that you said, really? And they said, what? And you said, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Joanna? So it was a tough transition. You know, when I was knocking doors, telling my neighbors I work in the Senate, so I understand Harrisburg. I, my first day in the House was the budget override vote when we were late in 2015 with a budget. And everybody was screaming and banging the desks. And I'm like, I've listened to the House on end when I was working in the other chamber. I never heard this background noise <laughs> or, or saw this rowdiness. And to just get to the House and to be, um, to this day, still one of nine women of color, it is challenging. Um, when I first got there, I'd have people say, oh, you remind me of my daughter, my granddaughter. Am I allowed to tell you you look nice? Um, you know, just a variety of challenges with interacting with a predominantly male institution, where at that time, not so much today, but in 2015, most of the men were like Chairman Taylor. They'd been there for 30 plus years. So it was difficult, but what I just tried to do is what I do in every environment let people know who I am and really listen to find out who they are, what their priorities are and build a relationship in that way. And very few times was it uncomfortable and strange. Usually people find themselves when you're greeting them warmly to give you the warm greeting as well and get to know you and not look at you like you're a child or less than because you're few, one of few women who are on the floor of the house. So you both have achieved historic uh heights and what you have done. Do you find as women in these roles that you lead differently or not really other than that sometimes you wear a skirt? Martina. So I, I am very much a lead by example kind of person and that's a model that I have taken ever since I was younger and in college I, served, I uh, was able to be the captain of my field hockey team to uh, today being able to, to lead many members across our caucus and try to bring people together. Because that's, that's really the key is um, making sure that when you say something and when you believe in something that you actually put your actions behind it. Um, when, whenever I come across a challenge, that's immediately what I think about. I'm like, you know, am I actually going to put myself in a position that the, that the other person's in and be able to express to them um, what needs to get done and, and how to do it? So um, I would just say lead by example has been my philosophy and I, I stick by it for sure. Is there any way though that you think in being a woman that you've solved a problem, broken a log jam, had a conversation, there's something that you think you did differently? Yeah, you know, I think it's more about being from Philadelphia than being a woman. Um, it's, uh, it, it's kind of our, our way here. We like to get stuff done and we usually don't take no for an answer. So I really, being a member of the leadership team, I definitely express myself at that table to ensure that I'm heard. And I do it in a meaningful way and um, I do it in a, when it's timely and appropriate instead of, um, you know, some people are just, you know, pests, right? And they're frustrating and annoying and it's like, why do I have to listen to this person anymore? But no, I really try to do it in a, in a meaningful, purposeful way so that we can accomplish the goals that we have here for Philadelphia and for our Commonwealth and for its future because our citizens are counting on us. Um, particularly me as the only Philadelphia Republican in the House majority that's ran by Republicans. Um, without me there and without Democrats being in the majority, Philadelphia, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of interest in what happens here. 
uh, without me advocating for us. So I'm always happy to lend an ear, but also make sure that our voice is heard from our area. Thanks. Joanna, is there a way that you think you lead differently because you are a woman or a way that you've put an issue to members or made them think differently? So I definitely think women lead differently. Our lives, our lifestyles, uh, so much are just not known to men. Um, so many things that we have to do and deal with, uh, multitasking, whether you're an actual parent or whether you're a caregiver to an older loved one, uh, we have the ability to, to do things and approach leadership um, with fresh perspectives because we're used to having no other options. I saw my mother, you know, a single parent, had no other options except to get it done. Whatever that means, does that mean working another job? Does that mean staying up late? Does that mean from first to fourth grade, finding the time to sit down with me because I couldn't focus and doing homework with me. So it means women are determined to be productive with the space we're in. And when I first ran to be the caucus chair, one challenge we had at that time was occasionally it getting rather rowdy. And the members were saying, well, what are you going to do differently? I said, just watch. Just wait and watch. It will be different and you will not hear from them. And I had my own methods. And then some people would say, why are you texting me about the noise? Because I don't want to embarrass you, but this is the first warning. If you continue your side conversation, I'm going to gavel you down and call you out on the microphone. Nobody wants to be embarrassed. But they'd say, we're glad you're not the caucus chair anymore. You don't send us those subtle messages. That's right, subtle, but not so subtle. And you notice she said that all with a lovely smile. So I started my career in magazines at Time Magazine, and the question always was, when would a woman get a chance to be the editor-in-chief? And as a friend said to me, we got it as soon as they broke it. The boys break it, and they're having all kinds of trouble, and that's when a woman gets an opportunity to come in. And I should say, she righted the ship in a number of ways. And Martina, I'm starting with this one with you, because when you came in in 2015, the party here was going through a lot of things in terms of the vote, attracting candidates, it was not an easy job to take on. Do you think that it took those dire times and challenges for them to finally be open to, let's let somebody different run the show? Yeah, um, look, the Philly GOP has definitely gone through uh, it, you know, different stages throughout its time. And right now, I think it's a critical, critical time for leadership in, that, in our party to take hold, you know? And when the transition took place, it was really um, something that in my mind had to happen. And so I facilitated it, you know, I took action. I, I went to the leader at the time and I said, look, you know, we just lost one of the city council seats. It's uh, pretty embarrassing actually, when two of them were reserved for the minority party and we need real change. We need to actually hold um, our counterparts and colleagues accountable, and likewise for us, um, you know, so that there is a two-party system at the very least in this city, and there can be diversity of thought and more, um, you know, more opportunities for different difference of opinions to come forward as in terms of candidates. So. I, uh, you know, I met with the chairman at the time, and I said, look, you know, I'm. I have the votes to, to make a move and, and I'm gonna do that. So I'm asking for you to please, you know, step aside and, and I, will, I will take this party in a different direction. And respectfully, uh, you know, you can keep your legacy if you wanna call it that. And uh, so, you know, I moved, it, I moved the ball forward for the party. This year we had um, just candidates coming from all across the city wanting to run for the state house. And I believe that that's where our focus as an organization has to be. You have to build from the ground up and you also have to be willing to, um, you know, accept change and realize that the, you know, the grand old party really needs to step up their game if they're going to survive into the future. Um, because there are young people out there who have, you know, conservative views, but they're a little nervous to express them um, because of some of the, the backlash that they get, um, you know, whether it be at college or, you know, so, some other places that have normally been able to, you know, you could say whatever you want to say, but you have to understand there may be some uh, ramifications for that. But as a party, I mean, I was just ecstatic because... The, the board leaders did accept me, uh, they voted for me, and I think that that being a woman in that role, being a young female taking on this responsibility was a big deal for our party. I mean, you guys still have Bob Brady, right? <laughs> uh, 
I'm just let me check the website. Check the website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check out the website. Um, but you know, we're we're really trying to build that momentum and get young, um, interested people who have conservative views, and they're not even like you know outlandish. They're they're real. You know, like school choice. When how do we make sure that our kids are getting a quality education and that their parents have an option um, when they're not getting the the right um, educational opportunity in our in our local public school? Can they can we send them to a private school or a parochial school, et cetera? Um, you know, so those are just some of the areas where people have an opportunity to come and express those views and start to advocate for those issues that they care most about and what's impacting their community when, you know, maybe our colleagues, our people, the public don't feel like they're getting the job done. Um, so I'm excited about it. I'm really uh, just proud of the work that we've done so far. You can go on to phillygop.com and check it out. You'll see some of our candidates. We came pretty close on a special election for state senate. Uh, recently, the gentleman who ran was Sam Pisa, and we got 45% or so of the vote. But, um, you know, we're working toward having, having a goal, having a plan, and it's long term. You know, it's not going to happen overnight um, unless everybody in this room wants to switch to Republican before the end of the day. Uh, <laughs> I'm allowed to say that here. Um, so, but you know, this, this is, this is all part of it. It's part of the process and we just appreciate the, the, um, you know, your indulgence and the opportunity to be a part of the city and have that alternative view to express it here. And Joanna, your views on a sense that sometimes it takes the guys bollocksing it up before they'll let a woman take a crack at it. Did you find that to be the, the case in some things? So similar to my first run for state rep in 2015, I was not uh, going through the last election cycle gathering votes for leader. Um, I was very happy with the leader we've had. He had been good to myself and other members. I was proud to finally work with him at a table as the caucus chair. Um, I really thought I was just putting votes in my pocket for caucus chair re-election. And uh, Martina's work out outdid her uh, because my leader lost um, in southwestern Pennsylvania. He was the last Democrat in Westmoreland County. And when he succumbed to, you know, the electoral defeat, members, um, interestingly enough, first in Allegheny County, started calling me saying I should run. And I'm like, why would I do that? You know, I've got a nice leadership opportunity and I don't want to take on the whole caucus, you know, and be responsible for everything from HR to, you know, being on the floor fighting nonstop to giving the last speech on important debates. I said, with all due respect, I'm sure there are other folks who are interested. And they said, well, Joanna, you're the only woman who's on the leadership team. If you don't run, when will a woman run? And it was something like that, that's the usual guilt trip that you all do, that started to resonate and I kept hearing it over and over again. If I don't run, when will a woman have an opportunity? And because it's true, just like other positions as Martina was describing with her prior set, uh, predecessor, once you're in charge of something, you usually stay for a little bit. You don't stay forever, but you stay for a little bit. So it's like if someone else was to run, it was going to be a man and he'd likely be the leader for a few terms or several or who knows how long. So I thought to myself, let me see if we can get some traction here. Talk to my colleagues about what my vision is for our caucus and how to have a fresh approach. Because the one thing that is true, everything in life changes. And if we are so holding on to the way we thought electoral politics should happen or the way we perceived who should be on the floor giving speeches, then there's never room at the table for different voices. There's never room at the table for women to take a shot at it. And so I'm thrilled to be at that table and to be doing the job as the leader for our caucus and I recognize and they recognize that my approach is in fact different. They, uh, the, the top tier staff, they're like, we're just not used to this level of engagement. I'm like, no, I want to know what happened with the meeting. I want to know what people ask for. I want to know where we're standing as we approach this budget that's coming up and we have everything lined up so that we're responsive, so that we are actually showing the difference of my leadership, not the way you all had done things for the last few years. So it's an exciting challenge, but it's also requiring lots of hard work. And a question I'm sure lots of people in this room have, as we look at Pennsylvania, to have never had a female governor, to never have had a female senator, when will the woman in City Hall be running the show? These are questions we have. Why hasn't that happened? And which party do you think will get there first? And I want an honest answer. I know you're supposed to say your party, but an honest answer. Martina. Um, a girl can dream, okay? No. Uh, no, so I, I would say, 
I think we're more likely to see uh, the first female governor before any other maybe position that's up as of late in terms of U.S. Senate or Congress uh, on the Republican side. Even our congressional delegation does not have a female Republican representing the Commonwealth anywhere uh, down in D.C. So, you know, we're really, um, you know, working toward that and making sure that more women run for office. We need to constantly encourage women, especially young women, to get involved in, in um, you know, anything political, you know, whether it be at the local level or, or higher up, but um, you have to be civically engaged. You really want to make sure that these young women know that they have a support system once they even get into office, that it's okay to be able to have a family and that you can do it. It's real. Like, Every day there are women out there who get up and they take care of their kids, they get them off to school and then they go to work and they, you know, they make these um, important decisions for the Commonwealth. And, um, you know, for, for me being a, a young female in Harrisburg, it's, it's challenging because you, look, you don't want to be judged, but every day we get, we get judged no matter, you know, you know, are you going on a date over here with that guy and why, or, you know, um, what, what, what's your, you know, what's your deal? And, you know, you just have to recognize that you have your own life to live and you are able to achieve what you, you set out for as your goals. Um, and anything is possible. And I always ask myself, like, why not me? You know, is there something I need to learn? Is there something I need to do to train or to, uh, get better as a person in order to achieve that end goal? Um, and th that, that's a really good question to ask yourself periodically. Like, you know, why, why not me? Why don't I deserve to get a raise? Why don't I, you know what I mean? Like those are those types of questions that really um, make all the difference as you try to build yourself up and be, be able to encourage other women to get involved and, in, and engage in the, the uh, political process. And I would just say one other thing real quick. As Republicans in Harrisburg, as females, we, we do get together and we talk about what we actually need in order to, you know, if support the other female, if they want to go to Congress or they want to become the Attorney General of Pennsylvania, like how do we as other female colleagues help to support them to get there and to make the right contacts and connections? How do we network with um, other people who can support that effort as well and kind of team up and, and tank out, you know? So. Why do you think it hasn't happened? Why do you think we haven't seen a Republican woman sitting in these positions? I think it's more just the, that we need more women to run. And the more frequently that happens, the more the public will be acceptable to voting for a female to, to run in Pennsylvania. That, that's what I... Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. I think that's really the key, is that people have to become more accustomed to seeing uh, women being in the role of leadership and being able to do the job well and to express our views in, in, in a positive light. Joanna? I'm going to start with that, able to do the job well. When you are the first woman to do one of these jobs, the amount of pressure and the expectation that you not just do it the way the last man did it, but you do it 10 times better, I mean, it's unbelievable. But I'm very grateful to many folks I see in this room, Lois Haggerty, Mustafa Rashid, Christine Jacobs, to make sure that as the first woman, I'm doing it better. I mean, you cannot do it by yourself. If you don't have folks who are literally patting you on the back, encouraging you, showing up to your events, letting you know when you need to improve because we all need to hear that. Yes, you need to improve on that skill or you need to get better in that area. But without that support, it doesn't happen. And without women starting everywhere, I mean, we're in the city of Philadelphia, but anyone who's here from one of the counties and you live in one of the municipalities, run for school board, um, run for state representative, state senate. If we don't see anything changing if we don't actually put ourselves out there. I am thrilled to know that in the city of Philadelphia, we have a mayor's race next year. So I'm not going to say we will not have a Democratic woman become mayor. I would love to see this city ran by a woman who's been in this city, whether she's born here or moved here, whatever it might be. It would be exciting. It'd be an exciting opportunity for change. Of course, while they're recounting the ballots for the Senate primary, uh, I don't know how they even trust those ballots, by the way. Um, <laughs> They were just trying to throw them all out. I mean, it's, it's odd that now our election system is actually safe and secure. The irony. 
it's just crazy. Um, but, but, but there haven't been a woman, there has not been a woman on either side of the ticket. There were women on both sides of the primary. Neither of them made it out. So we will not see a woman United States Senator in the immediate future. There's a governor's race this November and there are not any women on that ticket at this time either. So uh, I think we have to get real serious about if we want to see women go to those higher offices, it, that you, they just don't get there. I was teasing Martina when we were having lunch because I called her and told her she should think about the Senate. Or I talked to her on the floor about it last year. I said, you should think about running for Senate because it, at the least, it elevates your profile, gets you new donors. I mean, you, you have to get out there. And, and when you think about where you are now, women who are currently in office have to figure out, will this compromise what I'm currently doing? Will this be a problem for my voters or my constituents or whoever I serve right now? So we have to get more women to the table to run for other things and not just say, well, you two are in office, run for everything, because that's not smart. <laughs> Why do you think why do you think it hasn't happened yet that people could imagine a state rep or a school council member but they can't make that jump to putting a woman in those seats why do you think it hasn't happened Absolutely so it, it's a level of progression so you randomly or do not see women, you know, just waking up one day saying, I'm running for the top office in the state as the executive. I'm not, I'm, I have no public experience in service or elected office, and now I'm going to run for governor. So let's look. In the Pennsylvania Senate, there are 50 senators. There are only 14 women zero women of color. In the Pennsylvania House, there are 203 of us. There are 60 women. It's the highest it's ever been in our history. And there are nine women of color, zero Latinas, only one Asian woman. Um, so the, the, the representation is low. Pennsylvania is kind of at the bottom for representation. We have 51% women in our population, but only 27% in the state legislature. So how is a woman just going to wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a United States senator? if they don't start as a state rep or as a state senator and build a base of support so that they can go from there and take off. Until that is resolved at the bottom where we currently serve, where we don't have as many women as we should, until that's resolved, I don't know how quickly we can have a serious candidate for governor or for the United States Senate as a woman. But certainly, it's something that needs to change because if our daughters, our children do not see it, how can they dream about it? You both are involved in urging people to run and grooming candidates. Do you find that it's different getting female candidates to step up? Do you find it's harder for some reason? And what's the one piece of advice that you give them? There must be something that you say, keep this in mind. So I would say just a couple of things. One of which is, yes, it, first of all, it's challenging to recruit candidates in a broad respect. Uh, as a Philly GOP chair, I, I fully understand that because people don't want to have to put themselves out there. They don't want their whole social media accounts from when they were like in college to be out in the public arena. They don't want their own personal you know, issues that may have happened in their past to come forward. And everybody goes through life and life is challenging. So everybody has something out there that they are worried about. So trying to put those kinds of um, concerns to rest is, um, you know, something that we work through with candidates. But um, also, I think in terms of when we were speaking earlier about women and running for higher office and trying to recruit candidates for that, you know, the financial uh, commitment on that end, if, as you've noticed with the U.S. Senate race, these are multi-billionaires in the race, right? At least on the Republican side, I can't speak to the to the other side, but you know, on the Republican side, these people are like multi-billionaires that are running, and that financial um, you know aspect, even like Governor Wolf, right? He was a you know self-funded. These people are coming in, and they are self-funded, and it's not always necessarily the the way in which. Um, good leaders uh, are able to, you know, come about. That's that's not necessarily the best way either, in my opinion, because you want local people to build themselves up over time. You want them to be able to grow and understand what the procedures are in Harrisburg or locally when it comes to your county government and be able to understand Pennsylvania as a whole and how it functions and how it can improve. Whereas when the folks come in from the outside, it's, it, it can be good as a, like a disruptive measure, but it can also be destructive. And we need to ensure that we're selecting candidates um, that we know can actually lead. You know, back when Governor Ed Rendell, as the terrorist is named after, he loved everything about Pennsylvania and promoted us, promoted us across the country, across the world as a, a place to come and be and, and prosper. 
Um, today, you know, you kind of look to who is the major leader in the Commonwealth, who is doing that, um, who's responsible for that, and that's, you know, where we're kind of struggling, I think, and that's why we see some of the concerns around the, you know, who the candidates are that are running, are they really going to, um, you know, do do what's in our, our best interest when they're just coming in with the multi-billions of dollars to, to run a race, whereas, you know, a candidate like myself, like running for U.S. Senate, i that sounds amazing, but I don't necessarily want to go to D.C. Uh, the, there's too many, you know, battles down there I wouldn't want to have to deal with, I think. But <laughs> Nobody wants to deal with an insurrection. No. <laughs> True story. True story. I think I just want to go to coffee with these two monthly and bring popcorn. Huh? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I, I was just saying, in, in terms of supporting women to run for higher office, really look to that and financially support because there are these guys that are out there, which we love our guys, but you know, they're always right there to and easily will write the check out for their friend because it's their buddy or, you know, because it is a guy that they can easily relate to. Whereas the female candidate doesn't have that type of level of financial support that we would like to see, I think, uh, to be able to grow in that role. And I'll say, you know, we all have to spend time making fundraising calls. And I can recall very early on calling a, a personal friend, and it's harder to ask your personal friends for money um, for you to run for office, no matter how great your ideas are and how wonderful it would be to change these laws. And my personal friend said, um, you know, I gave her the levels of this event, and she said, I think I can do $25. I'm thinking not one shoe in your closet costs, you know, less than $150. $50, but you know, I need to raise 50 grand and you're going to give me $25 and you're like, thanks, you know, with a smile on your face. And it is difficult. So I'd encourage the entire audience for the women that are in elected office that you believe in, that you make sure you're there for them because it's not the same. The men who are lawyers, I'm an attorney, the men all get a job at a law firm automatically. They all become partners at a firm. They, they're able to host this event and host that event. And women, it's much more difficult because oftentimes, and I was recruiting a woman who I spoke to this morning who said, I couldn't have won without you. And I said, no, you didn't win without you. I wasn't there. I'm not the candidate. I didn't knock the doors. I might have sent you some help, but you are the one who was able to get this victory. And it is because she was trying to figure out if I'm a business owner, if I have a family, if I have to take care of my sick dad, how am I going to also run for state house? And I'm explaining to her, the seat is open. There's no incumbent. This is the best time. We take advantage of these opportunities for you to put yourself forward, even if it means you have to figure out how to manage the 10 and burners on the stove all going at the same time. I think we're all concerned about the state of our democracy and our ability to be civil at best and productive in any case. And I, I noticed, you know, we've just got through a primary season. Everybody's fighting. That's the tagline. I will fight for you. I'll fight for this. Fight, 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 fight. And I said, I'll vote for anybody who says, you're not going to get everything, but you might get some things. We can figure out how to give everybody something. I don't think that ad is coming. Do you think if we had more women in the game, we could maybe have a, a conversation or a political discourse that wasn't always about you are my enemy? It feels like we forget that we're all Americans. You are not my opposite, you are my enemy. Well, I think Joanna's amazing and I don't find her to be an enemy. Um, we do work a lot together. It's It's... You know, I think it's a sign of the times, and I think in part it's the ramifications of of social media. I think people are living in bubbles, you know, um, and they only are uh, having their ideologies reinforced with social media, um, and also the the media itself, what we watch on television. It's all just a reinforcement of the ideologies that people probably deep down inside hold. But I think that if we can get past all of that. Um, then we can get a lot of really great things done in Harrisburg and elsewhere. But um, you, like you just said, the, the primaries really showed how polarized uh, Pennsylvania, and I think the nation is right now. Uh, by electing on our Republican primaries, we had a lot of candidates, so um, it kind of pulled away by dividing up the vote amongst the more moderate, maybe common sense candidates, and we are now in a more 
uh, you know, further to the right candidates are winning. And in part, it could be because, you know, they don't see that the Republicans are getting the things that they want done in Harrisburg, so they're pulling further to the right. But I think even on the, the left, we see a pull further to the left, more progressive. The more progressive you are, the more money you get, the more, you know, support you get. Whereas if you're just a moderate Democrat that's trying to get stuff done, uh, you're out, buddy. Like, it's not okay. You're not, you're not, doing well enough for us um, in terms of the agenda that's out there. But um, somewhere in the middle are the people who are common sense and are able to get stuff done and they do work across party lines. And that's where I, I do my best to not only maintain my position in leadership by uh, supporting some of the more conservative issues, but also trying to keep that common sense line to ensure that um, you know, we actually do help Pennsylvania move forward in a positive direction. And it, it's a very difficult line to hold, but um, I do my very best, I can say that. So. No, you do a good job at it. When Martina goes way off, I tell everybody, she just needs to stay in leadership. Don't, you know, don't send her wild texts. Let her do what she needs to do to stay in leadership and hopefully advance, move up. I wish that she was currently the leader because if she was the leader and I was the leader, I know that we could come to you today and say for the last year and a half, we passed these important bills. But I can't say that because there's real politics happening in the state capitol where the agenda is non-existent. The agenda is to block, to obstruct, and to not spend the people's taxpayer dollars. And it's unfortunate because we find ourselves in year three of a pandemic, small businesses still struggling, billions of dollars from Washington that we may have to return if Martina's colleagues don't get their act together. It's unbelievable. No, I'm serious. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the fact that the caucuses as a whole are deciding to not do anything, to sit on their hands and say, well, what could we possibly do? We don't agree. And why isn't there an agreement? Because people are on the fringes. People are far, far on each side of the caucuses. On each side, you see the same types of ideology. Well, if we don't agree on all 10 issues, then you're not in my party. And that's unbelievable. We've come to that. When we did our swearing in last year, it was on the 5th of January. My entire speech was about us realizing the fragility of life and our democracy. As we sit in this museum, steps from where our democracy was born, we have to get real about it. We have to get serious about it. And we have to ensure everyone we know participates in the process. I have no doubt that the folks who are here, you all voted on May the 17th, but the folks who didn't vote, the fact that we had 20% participation in the city of Philadelphia, it's absolutely unacceptable. We have to let younger people know that it does count. Each vote does count. Choosing leadership does matter as much as we all want to be apathetic and say nothing will get better or nothing will change we have to be involved we have to inspire we have to stir up the interest in politics and civics in our youth and our young adults so that as the times continue to change they'll actually not just be engaged but they'll be interested and ready to also run for office themselves one day all right I'm getting the five minute yes I'm getting the five minute warning, so we'll let this be the last question. As you know, we've had a horrifying week, and it's not the first, it's not the last, unfortunately, that we will see on some issue in America. And I would imagine it sits with you in a different way because you're in positions of leadership. Is there something you say to yourself, some sort of motto, something you think on at times like these when things are so heartbreaking? I'll start with you, Martina. So, you know, I, I really, I have no words because I just get very upset anytime that I see violence on our streets um, and what happened in Texas with the, the students and the teachers uh, who were taken from our, from our nation, um, future leaders potentially. Um, you know, the, it, it, it definitely is heartbreaking. And as a, you know, as a leader, you really have to stop and think about all of the actions that we take, are they enough? You know, are, how much more can we do? We have to do more. Um, and what are those solutions that will help for the future? Um, you know, I, all I think about is trying to 
find those solutions, find the fix that will actually work, and then how to get it done. Um, you know, I would say in terms of our, our Republicans in Harrisburg, you know, there's politics in everything, sadly, and um, this is no exemption, right? So we have to, we definitely have to find, like I said, the solution that will work to help support our children and their families, whether it be mental health resources, um, whether it be making sure that our schools are def have additional security measures put in place and protocols. I know I was talking with our honoree earlier today about this very issue. And, um, you know, it's just sad that our society has brought us to this point, but we actually have to take action to to make a difference. And I think that those actions involve making sure that those soft targets are hardened, that you know there are more security measures at our schools and that um, you know there are more health, mental health resources available to those individuals who are facing severe, severe issues at home or um, have gone through what, what the person there had gone through and uh, who conducted that violence. So I just, in times like this, I, I look to God and, and, I, and I just say prayers because it's really all that's left when, when policymakers uh, aren't doing a, a, a well enough job, in my opinion. So we have to do more. I would say that our, our caucus is looking into measures in Harrisburg and obviously working with our colleagues across the aisle to find more solutions for our Pennsylvanians and our children here. Joanna, Joanna last word. Yeah, so I was uh, rather defeated yesterday because I always hear uh, an eagerness um, from my colleagues across the aisle to want to solve issues and resolve problems when we are talking especially about danger and violence. And I, unfortunately, am no stranger to violence. My brother survived a gunshot when I was a child here in Philadelphia and West Philly. Um, and anyone who lives in our region, we are inundated with mass shootings all the time. During the weekday, during the weekend, it is not anything that we are strangers to because we've been overwhelmed as every major city has throughout this pandemic. It's just awful. I spent every Sunday about an hour and a half reading through the Times, and it was about a month ago that their lead story was gun violence in America totally out of control. They were talking about Pittsburgh, they were talking about Chicago, they were talking about Philadelphia, but when we see incidents happen that are one incident where there are several people targeted, particularly innocent children or innocent shoppers in a store. I just wanna remind everyone that there was an armed security guard at that supermarket in Buffalo. There was an armed officer at that school in Texas. So the idea that we need to have security I don't think it will protect anyone because we see that it is not working. One measure that we put forward on yesterday was to do an emergency vote on a ban, a full ban of assault rifles because there's no... There's no legitimate reason for them. They are weapons of war. You should not be able to buy them and purchase them and have access to them. We can talk about mental health, but we don't fund mental health in Pennsylvania the way we should. We have to get serious about that in this upcoming budget. We can talk about out of control violence and what's the best solution, but the truth is there isn't one answer. We have to restrict access because clearly people are accessing these firearms and they do not have the ability to use them appropriately. They're not defending themselves or their property. They are targeting people, targeting any one of us. It's absolutely unreal. In 1791, when the Second Amendment passed, we didn't live in these types of conditions. First of all, I wouldn't be sitting on this stage, and that's a, another story for another day. But the idea that we're relying on centuries-old changes to the Constitution to say we can't do anything, we can't do anything, this is what this says. It's like, wait a minute, that's not an excuse. And as I go back to Harrisburg, June the 7th, I'm gonna take this same energy. I might have been defeated last night, but the work is not done. We have a lot of work to do to protect everyone to ensure something like that does not happen in this Commonwealth.
I want to say thank you to all of you for being here. I want to say thank you to you two ladies. I want to say, Martina, you need to run to be the Republican leader so y'all can get things done because I think that's the way it would work out. All right, thank you. We're going to go back to our seats, and I think the program is going to go on. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, now we have that. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here. The show's not over just yet. If I could just have your attention for one minute. More than a minute, but you'll give it to me, I'm sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Cristella, and I'm the Chief Program Officer of the Committee of 70. Uh, And I am thrilled to step in on behalf of our board member, Lisa Detweiler, uh, who was unable to join us because of a COVID exposure, as we can all, I'm sure, are familiar with. Uh, I do want to start by thanking our generous sponsors, certainly Glenn Mead and Laura LaRosa, and all of you, uh, for your support of the Committee of 70 uh, and this event. I think it has been a phenomenal success. And thanks to our speakers and uh, to Tamla Edwards for moderating. It was just uh, a remarkable conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as, as much as I did. Um, and I'd also like to thank the staff that helped out today. We have uh, the wonderful women of the League of Women Voters. Uh, I am the president of the League of Women Voters of Philadelphia, so I appreciate that they uh, come to, to my rescue at times. <laughs> it's a nice perk of that, that job, for sure. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit, this is an, an inaugural event, this is the first time we've done it. I think the success says it will not be our last, which is great. Uh, and we were thought, thinking about giving an award. Committee of 70 doesn't typically do that. And in thinking about the type of award we wanted to give and to whom, uh, we had a lot of conversations. We said we want inspirational leadership, uh, someone with integrity and a track record a mile long of accomplishments and acts of service to Philadelphia and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And uh, I think it would be almost like a movie to tell you how it went, uh, but almost unanimously, Judy Von Seldnick. Her name uh, was absolutely... Uh, so we are, we are just absolutely thrilled to honor her for her service to Philadelphia to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and especially to the Committee of 70. Uh, I've been at the Committee of 70 for over four years now, and I can tell you that the majority of our board meetings after the financial report, uh, someone stops and says, my goodness, what a long way we've come <laughs> since the days where board members were bringing their own lunch or chipping in into a hat in the center of the table and the primary goal was uh, to support the institution so that it didn't collapse, so it didn't go bankrupt. Uh, we are recently received an $800,000 grant from the William Penn Foundation, which is the largest in our history. Yes, thank you. And, and a large part of our success was due to Judy's leadership. She made our opening events a success, getting sponsorships and inviting people. She chaired the search committee for Zach Stahlberg and then for David Thornburg, whose leadership allowed the institution to survive to the 118-year-old institution it is today. Uh, and I have just been so in awe of her leadership and inspired by that. Uh, Judy also is a co-founder of the Forum of Executive Women, and I know we have a lot of members of the forum here today, too. Uh, I'm happy to chair the public sector leadership, where we are actively trying to recruit women to run for office, to answer the call that you heard earlier. Uh, yes, more, more of that, please, yes. Um, and I'm also thrilled to report that the board of the Committee of 70 is now comprised of 50% women. Judy also played a phenomenal role in bringing these women into our institution to take this leadership role, and we are better for it. Uh, Judy also chaired our Buckholtz Fellowship Program, which Al spoke of earlier. We have several Buckholtz Fellows, past and present, here today, uh, to create a pipeline of future leaders. And, and I think that's something you'll see in Judy's, throughout Judy's career. Uh, from when she uh, was a pioneer in the search industry, 
Judy has identified and placed senior le level executive talent across the country for more than four decades. A born and bred North Carolinian, she began her career as an executive assistant to former Senator Walter Mondale, you may have heard of him, on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. She relocated to Philadelphia in the 70s uh, and joined a small firm that specialized in finding temporary jobs for women. She bought out her partners in 1974, like the boss that she is, and set out to build Diversified Search into one of the largest and most respected search firms in the nation. Under her leadership, Diversified Search grew to more than $100 million in revenue in 11 offices and ranked by Forbes magazine as one of the top five firms in the United States. She's actively served on numerous public and private boards and has been a lifelong champion of the advancement of women regionally and nationally. Judy was, as I mentioned, one of the founders of the Forum, which has grown into the largest association of female executive women in greater Philadelphia with more than 500 members. Uh, we certainly aren't the first to honor her, but I hope uh, this award will, will take its rightful place among your many, many others. Uh, also, I don't know if anyone has realized recently that Judy created the uh, JVS Philadelphia Fund for Women to assist women-led enterprises to mature and grow by providing a source of capital to women growth enterprises, leveraging the ex experience of established women leaders to provide consulting and advisory services and connecting women CEOs to resources to accelerate their growth. I'm sensing a theme here, right? Has ever, uh, G Judy's leadership and connections and eye for talent uh, and investments in things that she believes in uh, is remarkable and we're thrilled to award her today. The city, region, and com commonwealth are better for your work, Judy and your enthusiasm and commitment is remarkable and why we have chosen to honor you with our Civic Leadership Award today. Not often, that, um, I'm a little lost for words, but uh, thank you, Lauren, thank you, Al, thank you, Committee of 70. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful program from Martina and, and Joanne, and, and how proud are we to have women like you at your tender young age kicking butt up there in the state legislature. So you keep it up, girls. And, you know, I think one of the things, where's Leslie Miller? Les, Leslie and I have spent a long time raising money. Where are you, Leslie? For women candidates. She's richer than I am, and she lives over there <laughs> on the main line, and she raises gobs of money, but I'm over here in Chestnut Hill, and we do our best, but we, <laughs> we love to raise money for women running for public office. Um, I remember we had an event, my daughter-in-law is here with me, San, Shannon, we had a fundraiser at the house for Amy Klobuchar. Nobody really heard much about her. This was in the early stages and I think that we, I think we raised 130,000. We had 60 people and it was just mind boggling, but everybody was so excited about, you know, a strong woman candidate that really, um, you know, we felt like had a chance to win, but don't count her out. Um, but back to the committee of 70, I, I'll never forget way back in 2000, early 2000, I got a call from Keen Butcher, who was then the chair of Right, Marilyn? You were involved then, weren't you? Yeah. Um, saying, could you come help this committee of 70? It is a disaster. And uh, it is about to go under. It has no money, no leadership. And um, it's, it's really important. And I said, what's the name of that organization? I hadn't even heard of it. And, but he was my neighbor in Chestnut Hill, and he, he was a great guy. So we got together. And... Sure enough, it was a disaster. And um, it's first of all, money. So I got David Cohen and Dan Fitzpatrick and Leslie, a bunch of us, in our tin cup, and we went around to the corporate community saying, this is an organization that absolutely has to survive. And, you know, that's, that's the thing about the boys here in um, Philadelphia. Um, I've been here a long time working with them. And when, 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 it, when it really comes to important things, they fork up and they do the right thing. I mean, who would have ever thought 
that a woman could come to Philadelphia back in the 70s and be able to build a business that is the largest woman-owned, um, founded, uh, retained search firm in the world. And by the way, we have a new CEO, Aileen Alexander, 46 years old. Stand up, Aileen. I want y'all to call her now. She's awesome. And um, But it, it all happened here, and, and there was a wonderful business community that really, you know, underneath it all, they've really been very supportive of us. So... Um, and I think the Committee of 70 is a great example of that. And um, so we were able to get some money and get some good leadership. And um, we had some really fun people on the board. Marilyn Cutler, who's always been, you know, a major leader. And Diane Simmingson, and of course, Leslie. And I'm sure I'm leaving people out. But we all kind of got together and spoke up and got energized, and it's just been a real leader in this community. And, you know, this forum today, this uh, Women in Public Leadership, I just think this is an awesome. Congratulations to you all for doing this, and I hope you keep it up. And, you know, there's a real opportunity, I think, in today's world for women. There's, you know, there have always been windows of opportunities for the past, you know, I hate to have to say numbers, because I, I was my and starting to relate to my age, which I've lied about for 40 years, so um, we can't do it anymore. But, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I want to be an inspiration to the older generation. That's the new thing I'm going to do. But anyway, you know, I think there's just a real opportunity now for women in particular and, and no matter if it's business or politics or education, you name it. And um, I haven't seen it like this ever. And so I think that we really need to stick together here. And when I was coming along, like Molly Shepard, my dearest friend back there, talk about a, an incredible leader. Let's give it to Molly. <clears throat> Of course, she got her start at Diversified Search, but then she went on to soar. And then she, her daughter almost you know, won Congress. Ashley back here, you're going again, girl. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that, um, that there is a real opportunity now. And women are sticking together, and uh, we're there for each other. And, you know, it does take money, and women have got a lot of money nowadays, and women have more power than they realize. They are in really powerful positions in corporate America and in the political world and in education. I mean, look at the University of Pennsylvania is about to get its second woman president. Hello. And, and you know, but I don't think women realize just, you know, the power and um, influence that, that they've got now. And But there's an awakening, and it's this younger generation here. She's only 32, she told me. I thought, what? <laughs> and, you know, it's just wonderful to see that, you know, we as women are realizing our potential, but we're sticking together and we're doing what we have to do to get the job done. And that's really got to continue. And, you know, because at the end of the day, it's all about who's on the bus with you. And you got to have the same passion. You got to have the same mission. You got to have the same values, integrity, and character. And most of all, you got to have each other's back as women. And I've been very fortunate to um, have been on the bus with the right people for 40 some years. So, and, um, a whole lot of more women. Here's one here, Leslie Mazza. 40 years, she and I have been on the bus together. So um, anyway, I'm long-winded. You know, I get all carried away when it's talking about women. But I really, this really means a lot to me. I appreciate it so much. And, um, you know, I hope that there are a whole lot more of these that we can give out for a whole lot more years. But this is a wonderful organization. It deserves our support. And, um, you know... You guys, it's great to see you too, but you know, this is sort of the women. But, you know, let's go for it. Thank you.
So in closing, I just want to thank you all for coming and thank you all for your support of the Committee of 70 uh, and your support uh, moving forward after all these words, of course, if you, and I know many of you have for a while, of women in public leadership. So thank you.